Coming up next, countdown to the vote, a KCTS 9 election 2014 special. We'll bring you the results of our exclusive KCTS 9 Washington poll. Education funding and gun laws, that's what everybody was really talking about. Where do voters stand on the statewide initiatives about guns and class size? How do they feel about major issues facing Washington state and the nation? We'll get insights and analysis from our political roundtable on the congressional races and the battle for the control of the state Senate. Midterm elections aren't important? Well, we beg to differ. The KCTS 9 election 2014 special countdown to the vote is next. Good evening, I'm Enrique Cerna. We're less than a week away from Election Day, deciding on issues from background checks on guns to control of the Washington State Senate and nationally, the U.S. Senate. Our exclusive KCTS 9 Washington poll has just been released. And during this hour, we'll break down the results with our pollster, Matt Barreto, from the University of Washington, where he's a political scientist and also the director of the Washington Poll. Also with us to share their insights, Joni Balter, KCTS 9 political analyst. Brian Baird, former Democratic congressman from the 3rd Congressional District and now the president of Antioch University here in Seattle. And Chris Vance, public affairs consultant and former chair of the Washington State Republican Party. Welcome all. Good to have you here. Well, why don't you give me your thoughts on, on this election, the dynamics around it. Matt Brittle, let's start with you. Well, I think one of the big questions is going to be what does the voter turnout level look like? It's not going to look like the 2012 election when you saw the big uh, rise again in a lot of the Obama coalition, and that could have implications for a lot of statewide contests, congressional elections, state senate, and, and other things. Joanna Balter? Well, I hope the projections of turnout of 62% are wrong because there's so much important stuff on this ballot if you think about it. We're going to talk about class size, whether we should have background checks for guns. There's some local issues about pre-K. It matters. Yeah. Brian Baird. Well, at the state level, control of the state legislature is at stake. Federally, I think we can all be thankful we're not in a swing state. So we've been spared those <laughs> massive advertising <laughs> expenditures. But uh, at the federal level, the state U.S. Senate's in, in play. House is, is, uh, probably won't go Democrat, but could go the other direction as well. So a lot at stake nationally. And again, we also don't have a governor's race, but a great number of states do have governors. So quite a bit happening. Yeah. Chris Vance. Yeah, on Monday, Enrique, the NBC News Wall Street Journal poll showed Republicans with an 11-point lead in the generic ballot nationwide. In 2010, at the end of the election cycle, Republicans had a 9-point lead and picked up 63 seats in the U.S. House and 10 seats in Olympia. Low turnout plus sort of a Republican tide, kind of an anti-Obama tide. Republicans are going to make big gains in Washington, D.C. and Olympia. All right. Well, let's turn our attention now to our exclusive Washington poll. Matt Barreto, you've been working on this poll for us. Uh, it's a statewide poll. Uh, tell me as to when you conducted it, number of respondents, kind of the background of it. Sure, we've been doing this with KCTS 9 for a couple of years now. And we fielded this poll uh, just a couple of uh, uh, days ago. It came out of the field on October 24th, so it's brand new poll results. 600 registered voters interviewed statewide. And we were very certain to match the demographics, both the region, the age, the class dynamics here, because we have a, a very, very diverse state, and we take a lot of care to make sure that we have a balanced portrait of voters here in Washington state. Well, let's look at uh, what you found as the most important issues. We, we got the top five here. Let's take a look at that. Uh, well, education is right at the top here. Education reform, education funding, um, gun laws, I guess not surprising considering you got two gun initiatives on the ballot, fixing the economy, recession, taxes, uh, health care reform, and Obamacare still in play there. Uh, were you surprised by much of this? Well, a lot of times in midterm elections when there's not a presidential uh, election happening, we do see the state issues dominating, and you have that this year with education funding and gun laws. That's what everybody was really talking about. But some of those national issues still linger, uh, including things like uh, Obamacare, still something that people are talking about, both from a, a positive and a negative perspective. So while most of the focus is on the state election for voters here in Washington state, um, some of those national issues are still permeating the state. All right, let's talk guns. There are dueling gun initiatives on the state ballot this year, focusing on background checks. I-594 seeks to expand background checks, while I-591 would keep the status quo. 
Now, supporters of the two initiatives squared off last week in a one-hour KCTS 9 debate in our studios. Here's an excerpt. Why do we need another law, another new law? Well, we need a law because for years and years we've had a system of background checks um, in this country and in this state that has worked quite well. It stopped over 40,000 prohibited purchasers from getting firearms. We're talking about felons, the dangerously mentally ill, and domestic abusers. But currently, one of those individuals who is a convicted felon or domestic abuser can use the loophole in our current law and buy their weapon, their gun, from a private seller. What this does is simply expand the system that we've used for decades to all sales. It's not a new system. It's not new regulations. It's simply closing the loophole and making sure that folks can't go around the current background check system to purchase a gun. Uh a little bit of a different question for you, Fauchave, and that is uh, there is some speculation about 591 and that it was really put on the ballot to confuse things, to confuse voters. Uh, in other words, why do we need this initiative, 591? You know, minute. No, it was, it was not on the ballot to confuse things. It's on the ballot to present Washington voters with a clear choice. And it, pro as I said in the beginning, if 594 were a... Um, an adequate, a reasonable, a sensible background check law, it probably wouldn't be on the ballot. But 594 has so much overreach and regulates not sales, as, as has been implied, but all transfers of firearms, including loans, no matter how temporary. So 591 is a restatement of basic civil rights. That's, that's what it is. And it says the government shall not confiscate firearms without due process. That is already a constitutional right. Um, but it does pre present a clear alternative to 594. And we hope that if it passes, that it will force the discussion either to the courts or back to the legislature where, it, where things can really be resolved. All right, let's look now at our Washington poll. Matt Barreto, you did the polling on this. What did you find on those two initiatives? What were the numbers that you found? Well, on 594, the initiative that would require background checks, we found it leading by a, a wide margin, 64%. That's consistent with some other polls we've seen in this state. There seems to be pretty good support for that. We haven't seen a lot of opposition there. On the second initiative, on 591, we see a very, very different uh, picture. We see a split there. And most importantly, 591 is not over the 50% threshold yet. That's very crucial going into an election a week or weekend of whether or not an initiative can cross that 50 percent. A lot of those undecideds, people may be having second thoughts. It's a confusing initiative when paired with the other one. And so I would think that because it's not over 50 percent yet, it doesn't look good for 591. It only has a very, very tiny lead. And fairly or unfairly, uh, your polling was done before the awful shooting up there in Marysville. And so even if it doesn't really directly connect, there is a sense among some folks that they've had enough of just the absurd gun violence in this country. And so it, it probably adds you're to absolutely what you're right. saying. You're absolutely right. I think we, we have to consider the, the shooting in Marysville and how that will impact both initiatives. We will probably see the support for 594 go up and the support for 591 go down. The, you know, the, they say that this was not uh, meant to be confusing, but what do you think, Chris Vance? Oh, I think it was very purposely meant to be confusing. I think the, uh, the pro-gun side decided their strategy would be to try and um, prevent 594 from becoming law by passing another initiative that would dump it into the Washington State mm -hmm. Supreme Court. The fundamental case here is really simple. Um, the idea of background checks is popular with the public. I think it'd be extraordinary if 594 did not pass. Uh, I think it'd also be extraordinary if 591 did. Robert, your take on this? Well, I think it's very difficult to argue against the common sense of 594. And if you can't argue on the merits, try to confuse the case. And I think that Chris is exactly accurate. Well, I think that And, you know, I have to say that I think, yeah, let's face it, that the Marysville uh, shooting incident there definitely will probably have tremendous impact on this. I don't see how it cannot. Let's now turn to the other statewide initiative that's on the ballot. And that is Initiative 1351, 
which would reduce K-12 class size in the state. Here are the poll numbers on that initiative, Matt. It uh, shows that it is just way out there uh, with a yes vote. Yeah. Been there I, before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think with this one, you know, in terms of reducing class size and more uh, funding for public education, this is something that the state has been grappling with how to deal with. They've been mandated by the courts to deal with it. Now we have an initiative that would seek to enforce it. There seems to be very broad support for this. People are usually supportive of improving the uh, opportunities for their, for their own children at school, and it looks like this one's going to pass. But now, the problem with it is that there's no funding for it, and so what it does yeah. is it takes an existing state budget problem and makes it worse. Well, that's uh, one of the things that uh, really stands out here compared to the uh, gun initiatives. Uh, this class size initiative has been a bit of a sleeper in the sense because it hasn't gotten the publicity mm -hmm. that uh, the gun initiatives ha have gotten. Uh, some people, especially lawmakers. Chris Vance, I know you work in Olympia a lot. They uh, say that this is probably the most important uh, initiative on the ballot because of the McCleary decision and uh, the fact that uh, with that weighing on the legislature, this is kind of that time bomb thing. Yeah, there's tremendous angst in Olympia that if this initiative passes, that it cannot be, it becomes law and it cannot be ignored without a two-thirds vote of both houses, which is hard to achieve. Um, there's tremendous angst because people believe it will then put handcuffs in the legislature and they'll be unable to negotiate a McCleary settlement because they'll be locked in at this very <coughs> high spending rate for class size. Um, on the other hand, this class size that, this, that is in, uh, in, in 1351 is essentially what the Supreme Court said needed to be done via the McCleary. So it's very complicated. But the legislators are concerned because it's going to take away their freedom to negotiate and make a deal. Yeah, you know, I, I think we also need to look at this in both this initiative and, and McCleary itself. They're both input driven uh, uh, initiatives, basically saying, let's get smaller class sizes. Smaller class sizes has some merit, but the real issue is what produces the outcomes. And in our state, the best outcome producer is the college bound scholarship. And what we really ought to do, I think, is look and say, what interventions will lead to the most effective outcomes, not sort of nibble around these def definitions of class size, et cetera. Frankly, if you put more money into college bound, made all kids eligible who have good grades eligible for college. Spoken like a uh, college president, well, right? Something like all that. right. Well, interesting <laughs> enough, we're not eligible for that necessarily, yeah. but, but, uh, but, but if you do that, you actually have a better outcome and you don't take money away from college to fund the secondary school. All right, let's take a, a break here quickly. Uh, when we return, we'll turn our attention to a couple of the congressional races in our state and, of course, more results from our exclusive Washington poll. We'll be right back. Please join us on election night as KCTS 9 brings you live coverage of the major races and the statewide issues. Our coverage of election 2014 begins at 9 p.m. For more about our election coverage, go to kcts9.org slash election 2014. Of the 10 congressional seats up for grabs in our state, two are getting the most attention. Let's go to the 1st Congressional District, where Republican Pedro Celes is challenging incumbent Democrat Susan Del Bene, who's wrapping up her first term in the newly redistricted 1st District. They squared off recently at a KCTS 9 Seattle City Club debate on the Microsoft campus talking about minimum wage. Seattle is raising its minimum wage to $15 an hour. President Obama has proposed raising the federal minimum wage to $10.10 an hour over two years. Do you support that effort and why? And you have 90 seconds. We'll start with Susan Del Bene. I support raising the federal minimum wage to $10.10. I'm a co-sponsor of legislation to do that. As you know, the current federal minimum wage is $7.25, and by raising it to $10.10, we'll lift ne nearly a million people out of, out of poverty. Women are disproportionately impacted, more women in minimum wage jobs, and so it has a big impact on women across our country, women and their families. But um, this is a piece of legislation that is very, very important and will have a big impact across our country. We have the highest minimum wage in Washington State, so it has a smaller impact here, about a quarter over the two years, but incredibly important difference across our country. It has strong support. I hope we'll be able to continue to push and move that legislation forward so that people who are working full-time in our country are in a position where they can support themselves and their families. Thank you. I do not support uh, raising the federal minimum wage to ten ten or fifteen dollars, and the reason for that is uh, this state already has the highest minimum wage, and it will have a pretty significant impact in other states quite dramatically, a lot more than here, 
And in this state, it will really hurt more than help a lot of uh, young people and a lot of minority people that will end up losing their jobs. I see minimum wage as a starting job, not a, a, a living job. It's the job that you get the first time you go into work. It's how you start going up that economic ladder. If you move it up, it will be harder for anybody to get that very first job. But the reason why this topic becomes up a lot is because people are not going up the ladder. You know, they're getting jobs and not going up. And that is the real problem here. It's not take that first step higher and higher and higher, it's that people are not being able to go up. And the reason why they're not going up has to do with a lot of the decisions that this president has been taking. There are all kinds of programs that affect, give this what they call disincentive to work. You know, it makes it harder for people to go up that ladder because as they go up, they start losing benefits, they start losing other things, and it's harder for them to succeed down there at those lower levels. So I don't think that the answer is to put that thing even worse. All right, thoughts on this race, Chris Vance. Uh, yeah, Enrique, there's two things here. First, the first congressional district was drawn to be a 50-50 district. It's a competitive district. She's a freshman. It's a Republican year. Okay, so Susan DeBenny should be vulnerable, but, and, and I could say this, Pedro's a friend of mine, I've known him forever, he's a very smart, talented guy, but he just has not run a very good campaign, they've raised less than $700,000, I don't think they've done enough to reach the voters, to, unless the Republican wave is enormous, he's not going to win, and I feel bad for him. And he didn't do well in the primary, he didn't do which well in the made primary. me wonder about yeah. the whole issue, what happened to Steve Gonzalez when he ran for state Supreme Court, and uh, whether that Spanish surname worked against him. And, and that is a thought that I had as I looked at that, because because you had voters in the primary going for this more uh, American sounding name and they steered away from him until the final absentees came in. That is the elephant in the living room here. Will the Republicans turn out for someone who is an immigrant? Yeah, but rem remember, Susan Del Benny's done a good job. It's hard to say that she's made any mistakes in her first term. She's worked hard, she's shown up, and she's taken some important stands. The other thing you see with Celis is we've seen it a lot in this state. Someone with a lot of money who tries to buy the seat on the cheap. He mm -hmm. did not invest yeah. a lot, mm -hmm. and I think it's just bad strategy not to throw a lot of money at the primary to get a good, strong turnout with people voting for you rather than try to turn it around after the primary. Note to rich people, if you're going to run, <laughs> spend the money, <laughs> because we've got example after example. That didn't Matt, work. Uh, you didn't specifically look at congressional races because you do statewide polling, but you did look at uh, how people, what they think of Republicans and Democrats. Yeah, we did in a couple of different questions and statewide in terms of how do you plan to vote for Congress the Democrats still have an advantage over Republicans here and it is much stronger um, in the Puget Sound region and while that district stretches all over the place on this side of the state if you break it apart and look at the interviews that are there the Democrats appear to be doing a little bit stronger than they are in other places of the state so I would agree with Chris that it, it seems like it's probably not uh, a year for a Republican pickup in the first. Well, this, this was the year that you could have beaten Susan Del Benny. It's going to be a Republican year, but let's not overthink this. I mean, I just don't think Pedro has done enough, enough gross rating points, enough piece of direct mail, enough radio ads. There hasn't been enough of a campaign. Let's uh, turn our attention to the other side of the state in an interesting race there where we have two Republicans running against each other in the 4th Congressional District, and that covers uh, central and parts of eastern Washington. First time two uh, Republicans have been running against each other in that same district. Uh, also in a general election and a congressional race in our state of Pitts, uh, Dan Newhouse, who's considered a more traditional Republican against Clint Didier, a Tea Party favorite. And let me uh, make it clear here that we here at KCTS tried very hard to get a debate between these two guys and Dan Newhouse uh, immediately accepted our invitation. Clint Didier didn't accept anything. In fact, he wouldn't return our phone calls, really. What's up with that, Chris? Well, there's, there's an element in the Republican Party, and it's always been there, that, that thinks that the rest of the world is out to get them. Anti-establishment, that means they don't like the other elements of the Republican Party, they don't like the business community, they don't like labor, and they don't like the media. Um, <laughs> and they just don't like anybody. <laughs> we know that. And Clint, <laughs> and Clint Didier is the embodiment of that. He's an unapologetic Tea Party or love Sarah Palin. Uh, and this is a race between the normal Republican Party and that wing of the Republican yeah. Party. And thankfully, all indications are Dan Newhouse is going to win. And interestingly, Slade Gorton, former yeah. U.S. Senator, uh, mm -hmm. put together, was it a pact? Uh, uh, there was a bunch of people put some money together for an independent expenditure. That's how horrified 
typical Republicans are of the <laughs> idea of uh, Dan New of uh, Clint Dinier being in Congress. And, and Doc Democrat. Hastings also endorsed. Right. Right. Doc Hastings, Every. the NRA, and who else? The Farm Bureau, all the yeah. Farm Bureau. Yeah. yeah. And, and Democrats over there will likely vote for Dan yeah. Newhouse, right? right? Yes. Okay. Okay. And what about the Tea Party? Uh, you, you did some polling on sure. this, Matt. Uh, where, what do people think of them now? Well, you know, as we compare it to 2010, which was the big Tea Party year, their numbers are really um, declining here in Washington State, and that's not good news for Clint Didier. Um, 2010 was really his year, and, and he uh, has tried and run uh, for office before here and not been successful. And I think, you know, that they, he still has those solid supporters, but their percentages are more in the teens. They're mm -hmm. not enough to get them to the 51% level. Mm -hmm. What's happened there to the Tea Party? Well, I, I've seen this throughout my career. There's always a wing of the conservative movement that does not believe the rest of the Republican Party is conservative enough. They used to be part of like the moral majority, Ellen Craswell wing of the Republican Party. Now they call themselves the Tea Party. They're just opposed to the establishment in whatever form, including the establishment within the GOP. I think, I think very quickly, if you look at what's happened nationally with the Tea Party in the House, um, they've been responsible and they've taken the blame for some of the stuff that people are upset about in Congress in terms of not doing anything, government shut down, taking things off. You know, John Boehner himself has had a lot of problems with the Tea Party. So it's no question that that same thing is playing out here in Washington State. Well, remember, too, uh, Dan Newhouse is a pretty good guy. He's yes, got a he strong is. record, Secretary yeah. of Agriculture for the state. He served in the state legislature. He's a reasonable, common sense, bright guy. Worked across party lines. Worked mm -hmm. across party lines. I mean, he's, he's, he, he will make, a, 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 he'll do a great job. And can in, I uh, add to that? He was agriculture director under a Democrat, correct. under yeah. Christine yeah, Gregoire. Yeah. And that's, cons okay. that's the thing everybody loves, bipartisanship. Yeah, he'll, he'll make a so fine member of Congress. In a moment, we'll look at the too close to call races that will determine which party will control the state Senate and what that means for dealing with the big issues that await our state legislature in January. But first, let's address the issue of voter turnout and why it is so low in primaries and midterm elections. Does every vote really count? KCTS 9's Felix Spinell explored some recent Washington state electoral history. When we first started, what'd they say? Oh, he can't win. Dino Rossi ran Remember for that? governor against Christine Gregoire twice. And he also ran against Patty Murray for the U.S. Senate. So he knows a thing or two about voting in Washington state from firsthand experience. Dino, Dino. The race that you ran in 2004, the closest gubernatorial race in American history, that's right. pretty amazing. That's been about 10 years now. And that was, you know, was decided by, I think, about 150 votes. 129. 129? But who's counting? <laughs> It's been nine days since the general election, and still we do not know who will be Washington State's next governor. That 2004 race stretched on for weeks past Election Day. After multiple recounts, it was decided in Gregoire's favor by just 129 votes. So you'd think that the people of Washington would have learned by now that the old cliche is true. Every vote really does count. But in the primary election held in August, just over 30 percent of registered voters turned in a ballot the lowest turnout rate for any election in Washington in 20 years. I ran for this office in 2012 and I was surprised during that cycle how many people across the state were still very angry about 2004. Kim Wyman was elected Washington Secretary of State in 2012. Her office oversees and certifies elections and does things to encourage voter registration and voting, like reaching out to adults who haven't registered and publishing voter information in multiple languages. Unfortunately, I think that, that there are some people in the electorate that feel like their vote doesn't really make a difference anyway, or probably more to the point, they don't feel that they're informed enough. And this is at least partially true for Craig Tebow, a veterinarian in federal way. Dr. Tebow hasn't missed voting in an election in decades, but for some reason, he missed this one. I vote in Tacoma, so um, my congressmen and um, state uh, representatives uh, are you, the ones I usually vote for have been there for a while, and um, they're kind of a shoe in And then I also think part of it, so I feel like I'm kind of just checking the boxes for people that are already going to win. Um, and then some of my frustration is with some of the things, like with judges especially, I don't feel qualified um, to make that decision. And I, ask, I feel like that a lot. But something about Dr. Tebow and about the statewide numbers just doesn't add up. Thanks to the Internet, voters have unprecedented access to information about issues and candidates. And thanks to Washington's mail-in ballot, the act of voting has never been easier or more convenient. 
So why is voter participation dropping? Dino Rossi blames low turnout in the primary this past August on a lack of big issues and on the timing. Number one, there was no big statewide agenda on the ballot, so that usually draws people out. But I really think having it in August in a climate like ours, where you have to use every one of those precious sunny days to its fullest, uh, I think it really hinders it. You know, moving it back to say to the second week, uh, second Tuesday in June, I think would make a, a, a huge difference in, in, in the turnout. Regardless of when the election is held or what's on the ballot, shouldn't it be simple to vote and then mail it in? Isn't that just what you do as a citizen? During a time when Hong Kong residents are taking to the streets for the right to choose their mayor, does Kim Wyman think Washingtonians have grown complacent about democracy? If I believed that, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. My license plate on my private car is vote. Uh, I've been pretty committed to this for a long time. I really do think that an engaged electorate is the best form of democracy because the people who are elected reflect the, the values of their community and, and of their state. Dino Rossi thinks the solution is to ditch the all mail in vote. Uh, I would propose going back to poll voting. Uh, you get that sense of community back. Uh, you also, what will end up happening, I think your turnout will go up because there's a definite date, everybody knows what it is, it's not gonna sit on the corner of the desk. For now, most of the Washington electorate, about 70% at last count, are voting with their feet. If you'd like more information or resources on candidates or issues, check out this online nonpartisan voters guide. It's created by and for the people of Washington State, and you can find it at livingvotersguide.org. When the legislature convenes again in January, it's going to have a lot on its plate. Education, transportation, and a big budget deficit. We'll look at that in a moment. But first, the battle for the control of the state Senate. All of this comes down to several hotly contested Senate races. Now, Chris Vance, what races are at play here? What's the big one? Well, in my mind, actually, it's one they're probably not going to talk about. It's the 44th district. Oh, really? All year long, there's been talk about all these Republican incumbents being in trouble. But in the primary election, which is a predictor for what's going to happen in November, all the Republicans were above 55 percent, except Andy Hill was just right around 55 percent. The incumbent in the most trouble is Steve Hobbs, a Democrat in the 44th district, who only got 52 percent. I think Republicans are going to win all these so-called close races and, and go back to Olympia with a 26-23 majority. I'm surprised that you think it's that way because it seems like the 45th, where there's been a lot of money and attention poured into this, and go ahead. Well, you have to consider the fact that the primary is a good poll, but also general elections are more Democratic than primaries, generally yeah. speaking. And in this race in particular, so this is the narrowest margin between a, a Republican incumbent and a challenger. And so this one is, is really the hot one. And one of the uh, comments that was made by the incumbent, Andy Hill here, is something I think we were talking about in the green room earlier, had to do with climate change. And an unfortunate quote, or a fortunate quote, however you want to say that, about that there are scientists on both sides of this. Not so much, especially in that district. But there's been some big money here, too. And that is money that has come from uh, Tom Steyer, who is uh, from California, who has put a lot of money into, he, he's the climate change guy. Well, the challenge here, it's actually, I think, pretty sad to see a bright person who ought to know better uh, essentially pandering for a view that's contrary to all the best evidence. And I, Andy Hill's a bright guy. He's got a lot to offer, but to say that climate change is not scientifically valid is just not, is just not honest, and he yeah. should know that. And he really ought to own it, say we can disagree on the solution, but there, there should be no doubt in, the, in the, a bright person's mind what, what the Let's the move over is. to uh, the 31st, and that is where you have two Republicans running against each other. Uh, Pam Roach, who's been quite a lightning rod, and maybe some say Kathy Dahlquist has been as well. This has been like a kind of a cat fight at times, but does anybody know how this might turn out? Well, I haven't seen any polling, but this is a personality uh, contest <laughs> in some ways because, you know, State Senator Pam Roach, she says what's on her mind. She gets in trouble with her own caucus, and she drives people pretty batty sometimes. And so the, the, the whole thing about this is do you want someone who's easier to work with? Am I right? You're, well... I'm, I'm going to be careful here. These are both friends of mine. Uh, this really divides the Republican Party in a big way. And, and you're right. It's really interesting. There has been almost no polling on this. Everyone I talk to, they just put their hands up. They don't know how this is going to turn out. Either way, a Republican holds this seat. So it doesn't change the balance in the Senate. But you know, there's an interesting thing. We've talked about a couple of races here that are the, the result of the direct two-pass 
uh, the post primary. Mm -hmm. uh, this we wouldn't have been having this conversation. That's right. A while yeah, back. That's right. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to say is that these you know top two primary has now created this new cycle. And the original thought was supposed to be that if you have two Republicans, that they then have to compete for the Democratic votes and it should moderate the candidates, that they should come to the middle. But if you look at you know, Didier and you look at this race, it may not necessarily be that. They may be really going for the base and, and leaving the Democrats and the independents uh, scratching their let's heads. Let's go up north here because there's an interesting race there and that, again, comes back to that whole issue of climate change. And that is Doug Erickson and also Seth Fleetwood. And this is the 42nd district. Uh, right. What do you think? Doug Erickson got 57% in the primary. I have never seen anyone, when they get 57% in the primary, lose. Uh, that district is Whatcom County minus Bellingham, a Republican-leaning district in a Republican-leaning leaning year. Doug Erickson's going to win. And the other district uh, that has had some attention, that's the 30th with the uh, Sherry Song and also Mark Melosha. Uh, what do you think there? Well, I think Mark Melosha is running that district uh, as a Democrat, not as a Republican. He's changed, but his name is very well known down there, and he did fairly well in the primary. So uh, this seems like it could be a real toss-up in many ways. Is it too close to call, do you think, as not, far as actually, you don't Not think in my so? mind, not at all. I, I'm, I think the Republicans are going to lose the 48th which they've already lost. They've given up on that seat. That's the Rodney Tom seat. They're going to pick up the Melosha seat. And other than that, it's going to be status quo. What could be interesting is how many gains do the Republicans make in the House? Mm. Does it actually whittle down Frank Chop's ma uh, majority to making it difficult for him to control the House floor? I think in 2010, quickly, you know, we saw that the Republicans made some gains, but they made the gains that were easy to make. And that's the same thing nationally. They're not going to pick up 63 seats nationally. They're not going to pick up 10 seats in the state house because they won the easy right, seats. And usually that's there's a point. bit of a rebound. And so I would I would be careful to over sort of play the Republican wave. I think that was 2010. All right. 2014 let's, is status quo. Let's move quo. on here. Of course, uh, no matter who wins control of the state Senate, the legislature is facing some critical issues. Now, Matt, in our uh, KCTS 9 Washington poll, you asked people across the state what they wanted the legislature to address, as well as some of the things that uh, they may be thinking about our state leaders. Let's look at those responses. Uh, the approval ratings uh, for Governor Jay Inslee, he's at 54 uh, percent. That looks pretty good. Yeah, that's actually not bad. We've seen some turnaround in that. I don't know if it was because of the credit of the, the bridge collapse or the Oso mudslide. Um, he's starting to increase in, in his approval ratings, and we're seeing a bit of a turnaround from some of the, the early polls. The state legislature, on the other hand, remains uh, far underwater with low approval ratings. But, but they aren't as bad as Congress. Let's look at it this way. <laughs> okay. as bad as Congress. <laughs> All right. Well, um, you know, when lawmakers return to Olympia in January, they're going to be facing a billion-dollar budget deficit. And in our poll, we asked what should be done to address the uh, deficit. And, Matt, let's look at what people had to say. Uh, it's all about money. Yeah, so, you know, we've been having this discussion here in Washington State because we uh, don't have a state income tax. How are we going to generate that revenue, whether it's for education or for other things? And the public still tends to support a policy that focuses more on cuts. Uh, we are starting to see a little bit of an increase in the people who are saying some revenue increase can happen, but there still is, is much stronger support for a policy that is going to be doing focusing on cutting programs, which is hard to do when you take the McCleary decision. On taxes, uh, you asked uh, whether it was time for a selective income tax for wealthier families, uh, something that's been brought up many times here before. Uh, still, there is some agreement there. Yeah, and, and here again is where if we compare this to, to previous polls, especially when the initiative ran, we're starting to see a bit of an increase in opening to that idea. But we should take these you know, poll numbers with a grain of salt because there's no campaign happening right now. Uh, the state income tax initiative was way up in polls before the actual campaign started. And so, but I think it just means people are open. They know that we have a revenue problem. They're open to having a discussion, and now it's up to the state legislature. And on the economy, let's talk about the handling of the economy. Who do uh, state voters trust the most? Well, that's where the Democrats, and I think, again, this is a small reversal from 2010. That's where the Democrats still maintain a little bit uh, of an advantage there, five, six points over the Republicans. And if there's any tiebreaker there, when you think about the, account, the economy, if Inslee has over 50 percent approval and people are slightly more inclined to the Democrats, it could help them in some close races. Now, on the McCleary decision, the state Supreme Court has ordered the legislature to provide funding for K-12 education. Some $4 billion, the court has even held the legislature in contempt for noncompliance. Now, how did the poll respondents uh, respond to all of this? Well, when we read them the information about that, uh, we found overwhelming agreement that there should be increases in funding. Um, over three-quarters of people across the state agreed 
uh, that they should follow through and actually increase the funding. Of course, the hard part is finding out where to get the money and how to do that. Right. But the, that's something the public wants to see happen. Minimum wage, a uh, big issue, uh, not only nationally, but here locally, uh, particularly talk about the $15 minimum wage. It became such an issue here in Washington State. Uh, kind of split. Yeah, we found a, just a direct split um, statewide, 48% in favor, 48% opposed. Obviously, it was higher over here in the Puget Sound region. Seattle's already started to move in that direction of increasing the minimum wage. Um, but this is part of a larger national discussion, as you talked about at the beginning, these national issues creeping into Washington state. And on the minimum wage, there's no clear winner here. It is uh, fair to say the upcoming legislative session is going to be one of the most critical since the recession. Many big issues on the uh, table there, from education to transportation. Of course, uh, what to do about that big budget thing. What kind of session do you see, Chris Vance? A long one, um, <laughs> very contentious. Um, they must come up with some sort of deal on McCleary. Otherwise, they're calling the courts bluff. And they really have to deal with transportation. Forget building new projects. If we don't put more money in our transportation system, we're going to have big parts of our state highway system being deemed unsafe. Because there's not enough money right now to maintain what we've got. There's two mega issues, education and transportation. And the Republicans, and, there's going to be divided government in Olympia again. Republicans and Democrats have got to learn to work together down there. It's not happening right now. Absolutely. And somebody also needs a pen to tally up all the very expensive items mm -hmm. that you were just talking about. Transportation is billions. McCleary is billions. Initiative 1351 is billions. So there is going to be quite... Quite a moment down there, and it's going to go on so forever. So, where like does Jay Inslee play in all of this to actually get something done? Chris Gregoire was known as uh, the negotiator, the bring people to the table. Does he have that ability? He's going to have to roll up his sleeves, and he's going to have to address some of his revenue pledges for when he ran for for office, and that's going to be a challenge. I mean, we have the you know, opening question today, Enrique, was does this election matter? I think we just heard the answer. It matters an awful lot. But the issue is really, are you going to vote for people who can solve problems or are going to be ideologically rigid? Because mm -hmm. on either side, the, the ideologically rigid are not going to solve the state's problem. And of course, you know, as you found, Matt, in uh, the polling that people don't think much of the legislature, I said they're a little bit better than Congress, but that goes back to the fact that getting something done. Well, it's been very difficult to, to see that compromise. We've seen so many sessions extended. Uh, we've seen so many things referred to the voters instead of tackled in Olympia, and I think that's why you see that lower approval rating. But as Chris said, this time they're going to have to do something because there are some major issues <laughs> on their plate right well, now, not the least of which is the education fund. Yeah, well, they're being held in contempt. So how do they get it done? How do they actually come together to get well, something done? I believe, and a lot of people believe around education, the key is the so-called levy swap, levy exchange um, that... Republicans like Joe Zarelli, Senator Joe Zarelli supported, and Democrats like Ross Hunter, the chairman of the House uh, Appropriations Committee, where you, to help pay for McCleary, you lower local levies and raise the state's share of the property tax. Because what's unconstitutional right now is using levies to fund education. That, to me, would be breaking the gridlock, getting us closer to how much money we need. The problem is, as Brian said during the campaign, Governor Inslee said absolutely no way. I don't know how they get a deal on McCleary without doing some form of property tax reform. You know, what about the talk about climate change and carbon taxes and all of these types of things? Do you see that playing a role in this session at all? I Anything don't know if they that? have time this session no. because they are so preoccupied so with these big ticket items. Well, there's been some discussion that a carbon tax can be used to pay for some of this, and there might be that, that compromise. I, I agree with Chris. We've got to address this levy issue as far as, as just, if people understood the fundamental injustice of, our, of rich districts versus poor districts, Thank you. Uh, they would, whether that's the solution or not, but that is clearly the real problem. All right. We're going to turn our attention now to the national scene, the all-important midterm elections and control of the U.S. Senate. Let's set the stage with how recent global events can influence voters. If midterm elections are traditionally hard on the majority party, just throw in something completely unexpected to make things even more dramatic. KCTS 9 Stephen Haig talked with University of Washington communication professor David Domke about political messaging and how the politics of Ebola and ISIS have come into play in this election. Is Ebola the October surprise of this election? Well, that and ISIS, I think the two of them together have created a nationalized election. So what you have is this, this nation that's very concerned way beyond the scope of what the, the concern really 
is in reality. But, but that's, fear is an irrational phenomenon. So Ebola coming in has really cemented this. So in a four to six week window, which is when these issues emerged before the election, there's no possibility for a rational discussion. They become the ideal kind of fear tools in politics. How do the Democrats respond without appearing to be defensive? They have to make this a, a local election in all of the states where they're on the defensive. Ebola makes it more difficult for them to do because it becomes an election more about Barack Obama then. That's difficult for them. So they have to keep accentuating that, that hey, I'm, I'm the local here who takes care of this state. So your prediction for control of the Senate is? <laughs> My prediction for the control of the Senate is, is we're not going to know on election night. I think that we're going to go into overtime and that Georgia and Louisiana will go into runoffs, which will occur in December and January, and that the Senate balance will hang, it'll hang in the balance at that time. Probably at that point in time, maybe 49-49, uh, with two seats to be decided. I think that, it, I think the Republicans are likely to take control of the Senate, but they should, it shouldn't even be close at this point for them. They, they're, they're thanking their lucky stars politically for as terrible as it is for ISIS and Ebola. So what do you think? Have uh, Ebola and ISIS been politicized too much here? Well, events drive politics, that's for sure. I mean, we all, all of us politicians go out, we work so hard in our campaigns, but then something happens in the real world and it changes everything. Events have always driven politics, and these are the two events that Americans are seeing on their TV right now. Did you ever use that, Brian Barry? <laughs> Tried not to too much, but I'll tell you what, one of the frustrating parts is the attitude seems to be horrible things are happening and it's your fault. Yeah. It's, 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 it's too simple, it's, and there's no easy solution. It's funny use. because usually these sort of things, like national terrorism, or a national health crisis. These would be things that would normally benefit the president, allow him to stand up, look presidential, and lead. And in this case, the Republicans sort of turned the tables and attacked him. But All they're right. intractable problems. I mean, the, yeah. the, the fair question is, so what would you do? Are you going to launch a ground invasion of Syria to take out ISIS, or are you going to support airstrikes? Airstrikes make a lot of sense. but The most contentious part of this election nationally is, of course, the U.S. Senate. If the Republicans win, they'll have control of both houses of Congress for the first time in 20 years. Now, is it too close to call right now? Before our roundtable joins in, let's look at our exclusive KCTS 9 Washington poll to see how Washingtonians feel about the leaders and the issues. Matt, uh, you looked at the, the president and Congress and what people think. Let's look at uh, Barack Obama's ratings here in, in this. He would, he would love to have this approval rating sure. nationally. Yeah, he's at 49. He's at 49% yeah. here in Washington state. There are some who said no opinion or undecided, so he's actually net positive. Um, and so he's doing better here than in other states, but this was a state that he easily won, so he should be. Uh, but the U.S. Congress is not. Uh, very, very low yeah. approval ratings, just like we see nationally. Like I said, uh, you know, the state legislature is, does much better than all of this. Yeah. Okay, our two uh, U.S. senators, uh, they're doing quite well. You well, know, that's what's well so interesting. 50%. So people, as usual, don't like Congress, but they had, you had some high numbers for Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell and Jay yeah. Inslee. For all of them, these folks, have, they, we're sort of more forgiving. What do you but think? remember, too, that we, we are in a bubble here because we don't have any of those races. If you were in some yeah. of these states that are con contested, it is nonstop barrage. More than 50% of the funding coming from these uh, dark groups that don't, have, don't report their funds. So much of it negative, so much of it harsh. And as a result, there are some incumbents on both sides that are heavily on the ropes. Mixed uh, McConnell. I want to come back to that dark money that you talked about here. But, <laughs> you know, as a, someone who served in Congress, having a 23% rating or, and nationally <laughs> being in the dumps as well, that must make you feel pretty lousy. I think it makes a lot of members of Congress feel awful. Most members of Congress work awfully hard, and they're doing their best. They're, they're, there are these sort of recalcitrant, let's make sure nothing happens movements there. And it's, I can tell you, I talk to my colleagues, it is almost heartbreaking that they are trying so hard, they see these great problems, and they're not able to address them. It's but deeply frustrating. Let's also look at another issue, Matt Barreto, and that is uh, health care reform, Obamacare, should it be repealed? I, I don't, it, what did you find? We see a little bit of a turnaround here. Now, for the first time, 
Um, we see more people saying, no, it should not be repealed. 49% disagree with the repeal. Still a fairly high percentage. 45% want to see it repealed. But this is something we were talking about. The health care issue seems to sort of have evaporated now that it's been enforced for a few years. The Democrats seem to have an opportunity to try to take credit for some of the successes, and they haven't really talked about it. Chris Vance, uh, well, what, what's happened? Well, a couple of things. And Matt's numbers are undoubtedly accurate, but um, they are all registered voters, not likely voters in this election. This is statewide. Um, so it includes Seattle. None mm -hmm. of these contested races are happening in Seattle. With numbers as close as this, I would think out in the swing areas, you're still seeing a heavy majority where Obamacare is just not popular. And I agree, the Democrats have not been very smart about, about being um, hesitant to defend Obamacare. But because of those numbers, I do not see a lot of Republicans really trashing Obamacare anymore. It is not the right, it's not yeah, the Yeah, not as much as it was in, in 2010, yeah. clearly they did. Let's now you're on. taking something away from people. Mm -hmm. Now you're yeah. taking the health insurance from their kids, you're taking their right to the exchange, you're taking expanded Medicaid. That's a different picture now. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, undocumented immigrants and the whole immigration reform issue, which is still on the table here. Matt, you, you asked about this. You asked if, if undocumented immigrants should still be allowed to stay in the U.S. and eventually become citizens. Yeah, and we found uh, fairly strong support when you add together those who strongly agree and somewhat agree, uh, well over three quarters of people here across the state. And we found pretty strong support in the Puget Sound region, but also in eastern Washington, where there are a lot of immigrants and people interact with immigrants. It seems to be a, a, something popular here in Washington state. And this is an issue that's going to come up uh, undoubtedly after the election even more. Uh, let, let's talk about, you know, what's going to happen after the, uh, the election, because the governor, uh, the governor, the president didn't do anything about this. You know, this, this drives me crazy. The United States Senate passed an excellent bill on immigration reform that includes all the elements you need. Uh, and a third of Republicans voted for this. John Boehner and the Republican House leadership knows it needs to pass mm -hmm. and have the guts to go out there and put it on the House floor. I want my party to stand up and pass immigration reform this next uh, session and, and just say no to the far right because the rest of the American people know this needs to get done. Let's look at another issue here in Washington State regarding uh, the undocumented, undocumented immigrants uh, that are raised here in Washington State, graduating from state high schools, whether they should be allowed to pay uh, in-state tuition to state colleges and universities, and people here overwhelmingly agree with that. Yeah, this is something we've been seeing an uptick each year. Now, you know, of course, the. the uh, state legislature addressed this last year and so now we're starting to see a fairly strong majority support for this. People want to see those dreamers, as they're called, integrated into our universities. You know a group that's been too quiet on this, frankly, is the agriculture community. They Absolutely. will tell you one-on-one, -on -one, we cannot run our farms without immigrant labor. And oftentimes they trust the labor to run the show when they're not there, take care of their kids, etc. And they'll tell you in private, we can't work without these folks, but they need to stand up well, to, the, to the, the party they often support and say, on this issue, this party's wrong. I was actually part of a coalition this last year called the Washington Compact that included the agriculture community and law enforcement and churches and the business community, all trying to pound on Republicans to pass immigration reform. All the Republicans said, you bet, we'll vote for it if it gets to the House floor. But they need to go to their leaders and demand that it go to the House floor. I, the agriculture community does support this. Yeah. Oh, they do, but they're not vocal enough. Mm -hmm. so, so what? What are they afraid about? The talk radio base that has demonized immigrants. Uh, be, you know, Republicans live in fear of being accused of being not conservative enough. And on this issue and so many others, Republican elected officials need to do what Dave Reichert did. There was a bill this last year to deport Dream Act kids. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It passed the U.S. House. Dave Reichert was one of 11 Republicans to vote no. We need to see more Republicans have a backbone and say no to this stuff. And perhaps they will after the midterms because they'll start thinking of 2016 and behavior yeah. might change right along with that. Yeah. Let's talk about the issue of race and law enforcement, the shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, uh, Missouri. It's also provoked a big conversation nationally, locally. Uh, you did some polling on this. What do people say? Yeah, we tried to borrow some of the national questions that were being done and asked in the aftermath of the Ferguson shooting. And we found some similar numbers here in Washington state, even though it has a reputation for being a bit more pr uh, progressive. 49%, uh, the largest percent, thought that the Michael Brown shooting raised more uh, got more attention than it deserved and that it didn't raise the important issues. Only 39% believe that it raised important issues. So more people still thinking that it was overblown here in Washington state. And talk a bit about, uh, we looked at the perceptions about police interactions and minority communities in general. Yeah, again, on this uh, issue, and this is again something that we're discussing here in the city of Seattle, as well as other cities across Washington state, um, 
more people thought that race does not affect the way that officers interact uh, with uh, minorities or with non-minorities. 46% saying race won't affect it. Uh, only 41% saying that blacks and Hispanics maybe get worse treatment by cops. So again, there's a split there leaning more away from wanting to have the discussion about race. Voting rights, another issue uh, that is also very controversial out there. Uh, what did you find? Well, here on this uh, one, we found people a little bit more open um, on this issue. 52% believe that uh, discrimination continues to exist in the voting booth and in terms of access to the ballot box. Of course, all of the national discussions about the voter suppression laws, voter ID laws, have probably kept this issue on the table. You know, let's come back to, um, you talked a bit about dark money, those other things that uh, might be going on that can influence elections here. Uh, we talked a little bit about Tom Steyer, uh, uh, you know, nationally, there's always talk about the Koch brothers and things like this. What else do you see? What are the impacts on these? Well, people really need to understand that when, when you work hard to represent your district, and all of a sudden people you've never met who are not from anywhere can drop a million, two million dollars with some fake a front organization and tear up your repu rep uh, reputation, this is tremendously destructive to the political system I because it, it discourages good people from running and it skews outcomes of elections. I think it's making the voters more cynical it is, and, and is uh, contributing to the drop off in this election where folks are like, ah, I don't want to vote for any of them. Well, it's making, it's making legitimate candidates spend their entire life on the telephone instead of talk, begging for money, instead of talking to constituents, studying issues. And paradoxically and frustratingly, the Republican Party, when they opposed campaign reform, because they tended to lean, said, we just need disclosure. Let the market decide. Now, you don't hear that anymore. They're all defending dark money. And that's a big change from a few years ago. Well, Let's I don't know if anybody's defending unethical practices. I got a uh, press release today. There's some sort of Democratic group that is doing, from out of state, that is doing uh, really nasty mailings into Tim Sheldon's district and the 35th district. Uh, both sides do this because mm -hmm. they can. Yeah, um, right. And, you know, all of us who participate in the political process need to be good stewards of the process. The Constitution defends free speech, and we can't change that, but you need to be responsible in what you do in your campaign. Let's, ta let's take a look at some of the uh, presidential hopefuls that, uh, you, you know, they're, they're just uh, waiting to get going here. <laughs> well, they're already going here, but they're after going. this, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, we did some polling here, Matt. You, you posed some questions about certain folks. Hillary Clinton. Yeah, it's never too early to start talking about uh, 2016. <laughs> yeah. As you said, these candidates are yeah. going to be in there soon. Uh, Hillary Clinton has a very uh, high favorability in the state, 55 uh, percent favorable to only 38 percent unfavorable. Um, those are similar to some national numbers where so far, when she hasn't been facing any attack ads, she's looking pretty strong. And how about some of the others that you find? Uh, uh, Chris Christie, he's, uh, uh, well, he's still the, out there. Yeah, on the Republican, <laughs> side, on the Republican side, Chris Christie um, comes in uh, with 33% favorable, 40% unfavorable, probably one of the best known nationally on the Republican side because he lives in that big media market and he gets a lot of national attention. Uh, Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio, surprisingly, uh, I think a lot of people inside politics talk about him as a contender. We found that a lot of people here, 46% said they had no opinion of him at all, <laughs> that he just wasn't a known entity surprised. here. Those that did were split, so he yeah. wasn't necessarily more negative or positive, yeah. but he's not as big of a national figure as he uh, probably was on the other side of the country. Wishes so they don't really, so didn't you okay, find that 18% you know? didn't know who Paul Ryan was? Just yeah, ran for that, vice president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe Biden, uh, well, not too bad. Yeah, I think he's getting the, the, the credit of being a Democrat here in a state that voted for him twice. 43% in favor, 43% opposed. Um, not as strong as Hillary Clinton, but better than a lot of the Republicans. Ted Cruz, his name's been bounced out there. Ted Cruz is another <laughs> one who has, um, you know, a, a lot of national presence, but he just isn't known to the average everyday voter. 42% said they had no opinion or hadn't heard of him. And among those who did... 33% had an unfavorable. And Paul Ryan, you mentioned him. Uh, well, not that great. <laughs> not that great uh, for someone, although he just did, you know, was on the ticket and, and lost here in Washington State pretty badly. Uh, but surprisingly, probably is that 37% had no opinion of him, someone who was just involved in the 2012 presidential election. Well, well, let's, you know, one person we didn't have in the mix here was Jeb Bush, and this week there's been some talk about him. What do you think? Yeah, he's starting to creep back into the picture. There was a big article in the Washington Post recently. He seems like he's getting ready to run, by all accounts. Yeah. You, know, the, you know, the history, I was a member of the Republican National Committee for, for five years, and when you look at the National Republican Party, the establishment always wins. The, the, the far right you know, may not like people like Bob Dole and George Bush and George Bush and, and Mitt Romney, but they win. 
Right. And the establishment is going to pick the candidate. It's either going to be Jeb Bush or, if he doesn't run, Mitt Romney. All right. Uh, Joe, it's a little disconcerting that we've got this dynasty of it's either Hillary Clinton or <laughs> Jeb Bush. At some point, I mean, on the Democrats, they need another I, Barack Obama to jump. I mean, I think we like need that. some de some, right. some greater opportunity on both sides. I want to uh, sum things up here. Give me some final thoughts on this election and beyond. Go ahead, Matt. Well, I'll go back to where I started with talking about voter turnout. And one of the interesting things about Washington State, because we have the all vote by mail election, we don't see as big of drop offs in voter turnout as other states do. It's just so much more convenient. And so I think if anything, there could be a little sliver of hope there for Democrats in thinking that they won't see the same low turnout that they do in other states. It should be somewhat better than we see nationally. Johnny Balter. Well, I think, for example, for the gun folks, they really are dependent on some, some big turnout among women because a lot of the ads and a lot of the talk is about female voters and, yeah. and that sort of thing. So that's a key thing to watch for. I mean, the numbers are high enough on that initiative, so, so it's not dependent on it, but it's a key to it. Yeah. Brian I think it's two things. One, people need to appreciate the importance of the election. So turn out and vote. But secondly, after you voted, after the results are in, hold the person accountable for solving problems, not for adhering to ideology. Chris Vance. I'm going to take the opposite side of Matt. I, because we don't have a gubernatorial race or a U.S. Senate race, the only time in the 12-year cycle that's true, the uh, turnout's going to be around 60 percent instead of the normal 70 percent in an off-year election. That's going to lead to big Republican gains uh, in Olympia and uh, nationally big Republican gains. But I don't know if they get all the way to the majority in the U.S. Senate, but big gains. You know, it's interesting. Bernie Sanders, the uh, independent senator, mm -hmm. uh, says that voting election day should be a national day, mm -hmm. like a national day, so everybody should get out and do that. I agree with him, no matter <laughs> if it's a uh, general election on a big year or not. Mm -hmm. All right, the complete KCTS 9 Washington poll is online with much more information on how Washington residents feel about candidates and issues. You just go to kcts9.org slash election 2014. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it very much. Joni Balter, Matt Barreto, Brian Baird, Chris Vance, and of course, you all are going to be here on election night as we pour over the results. And we kind of decipher as to what happened. And make sure you join us on election night. That's on Tuesday, November 4th, 9 p.m., right here on KCT. TS9. Our live coverage will begin at 9 o'clock. Coverage of election 2014 and we'll see you then. Thanks for joining us.